radio's own show, Behind the Mic. Radio, with a switch of a dial, radio brings you tragedy, comedy, entertainment, information, education, a whole world at your command. But there are stories behind radio, stories behind your favorite program and favorite personalities and radio people you never hear of. Stories as amusing, dramatic, and as interesting as any make-believe stories you hear on the air. And that's what we give you, the human interest, the glamour, the tragedy, the comedy, and information that are behind the mic. And now, presenting a man whose name, since the beginning of broadcasting, has been a byword in radio, Graham McNamee. Thank you, Gilbert Martin, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience. This afternoon, behind the mic, brings you Fred Bate, NBC's news commentator in London. Hilarious mistakes by your favorite announcers, the ones they've made on the air. Lee Bristol, a real live sponsor. We will salute the old Palm Olive Hour with Olive Palmer here in person. And finally, three actors will demonstrate their resourcefulness in a most unusual behind-the-mic stunt. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, practically everyone who listens to the radio nowadays has heard news broadcasts from London by NBC reporters. But this afternoon, for the first time, we are going to bring you the -the behind-the-scenes picture of broadcasting from a war capital. In a few seconds... I am going to have a two-way conversation with the NBC chief commentator in London, Fred Bate, who is going to give you the -the behind-the-scenes picture of broadcasting from a war-torn capital. At this moment, NBC's assistant director of special events, Jack Hartley, in our New York studio, is in communication with Fred Bate. Chief Hello, of Freddy. NBC's staff of radio reporters in London. Hello, Fred. We're going Hello, to Fred. let you hear that conversation first. Hello, Fred. Hello, Jack. Uh, you're going on the air in about 20 seconds. We yeah. lost you here for a few minutes. Uh, technical difficulty, I believe. All right. And uh, due to the uh, technical setup, I won't be able to come back All right. and uh, give you a report on this program, but I will at 7.15 tonight when we contact again. All right, Jack. Okay, Fred, you stand by. You'll be on in 10 seconds. I'm standing by. Stand by. Folks, watch your clock. In a few seconds, we'll be talking to London. Hello, Fred Bate in London. This is Graham McNamee from New York. This is Fred Graham. How are you? Pretty fine, Fred. Fred, I'm going to ask you for some behind-the-mic scenes, some information about the way you broadcast. First, are you speaking from a regular broadcasting studio? Well, it's been regular since Sunday, September 3rd of last year. Before that time, it was part of the restaurant section in the basement of this studio building. Well, do you, do you and any of your staff live far from the studio? For the moment, about 300 yards. That is, counting the stairs down to it. <laughs> well, do you sleep in an air raid shelter like the rest of London? No, I sleep in NBC's ground floor office apartment. As a matter of fact, Graham, you should have said like some of London. Because only something like 20% of the people do sleep in shelters. I have slept in this studio a few times. How many members of your staff are there to help you cover this material, Fred? Three. We're told, Fred, that all broadcasts coming from war capitals are censored. What's the purpose of this censorship in London? Mainly to prevent military information going to the enemy. Uh Uh-huh. How much in advance of broadcast time do you have to have your material ready for censorship? Well... Theoretically, according to the rules, half an hour. But actually, Graham, in time to enable it to be read before a broadcast goes on the air. Well, Fred, if a story breaks while you're on the air, can you use it? Yes, if it's under no ban. That is, if no part of it contravenes defense regulations. How do you get the information you broadcast? Well, you get it through usual news service sources, official bulletins, and then personal observations, trips, conversation. Well, do you have to go out during an air raid to get material concerning some story? Oh, sometimes, of course. But as a matter of fact, we're out every night, and there's nearly always an air raid on them. Uh-huh. Well, do you have to wear a tin hat, Fred, when you're out covering a story? Well, there's no obligation, but it's, uh, 
It's only sensible to wear one if you're out doing a raid. Yes, I always do. They'll turn a small splitter, we hope. How do you get around town in order to get news and make necessary contacts? Uh, well, by auto or taxi or on foot. I must admit, I don't like being stuck behind a wheel if it's a bad night. It's the one thing that gives me claustrophobia. I take my hat off, Graham, to the drivers who are out night after night, no matter what it's like. I'll bet you. Incidentally, being an alien, I have to have a special, have to have special permission to have a car. Uh, being an alien, do you have to have special permission to get anything else? Yes, to stay out after midnight and to visit pro prohibited areas. Can you interview pilots who take part in raids, Fred? Oh, yes, and have several times for NBC Network. Uh, their names are never mentioned, however. Why not? Well, I think it's primarily a strong feeling of teamwork. The individual is merged with his unit. Then, besides, mentioning a man's name might disclose his unit, and that might disclose military information. I see. Well, what do you do for amusement, Fred, in the little time that you're not working? Oh, play golf once in a while, go to a movie occasionally. Newsreels, usually, they only last an hour. Do you see my newsreels, Fred? No, not yet. When's it coming? Any time. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Graham, uh, I find you neither miss nor particularly want amusement these days. There's a grand crowd of fellows here and plenty of amusement and conversation. But you know, a bit of fresh air, a glimpse of quiet countryside, bridges, hedges, and chapel, and the smell of burning leaves. That's the break that really comes just now. Uh -huh. There's one last question I think most of our listeners are curious about, Fred. On those European roundups, when we in America hear from your colleagues in Berlin, in Vichy, Rome, and other capitals, do you hear them broadcast too? Oh, yes, Graham. Here's me quite clearly. Sometimes on their way to America, that's when broadcasts are routed through London from, uh, well, let's say Dublin or Cairo. When they go from European points direct to NBC, by shortwave, for instance, by RCA communications receivers, we hear them coming back from New York over the South Atlantic circuit set up between NBC Studios and London. Thank you a lot, Fred. Thank you. Fred Bate from London for taking us behind the mic on your broadcasts. I'll bet, Fred. Good night. Good night, John. Good night. Oddities in Radio. Presenting odd little stories that help make radio sometimes amusing, sometimes exasperating, but always interesting to the people in it. This week's oddity. To show that even the best announcers make mistakes once in a very great while, we present what people in radio call fluffs, or mistakes of famous announcers. Milton J. Cross, years ago, in announcing a program of the A&P Gypsies, said... You will now listen to the music of the A&G Pipses. <laughs> <laughs> David Ross, in introducing Tito Gizar and his guitar, once said it this way. And now we present Tito Guitar and his famous Gizar. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Knight, in announcing the weather report, said... Today's weather, rainy, followed by claim. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph Edwards, now emceeing on Truth and Consequence, once introduced a singer as follows... And here is one of radio's most charming and lovely young sinners. <laughs> Jerry Lawrence, describing the ceremonies welcoming the King and Queen of England, uttered this little masterpiece. You will know the King and Queen have arrived when you hear the 21 Sun Galoot. <laughs> Art Whiteside, in presenting the Crown Prince of Norway on his station, made this remark. It is our extreme pleasure to introduce the Brown Quince of Norway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but Graham, we mustn't forget the most famous flop of all. <laughs> you mean... Uh... Yes, yes, when a certain announcer on the Edwin show, <laughs> in mentioning his product, said... Be sure to fill up with a tank full of fire chief gasoline. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes, and when Edwin got through kidding me that night, I never wanted to see the word gasoline again. It gave me the shivers for a month, I'll tell you. <laughs> no program.
program could pretend to give you the behind the mic picture of radio without devoting some attention to the man who pays and pays and pays for the radio program you listen to, the sponsor. Heaven bless him. So this afternoon, we have as our guest a real live sponsor. His outfit sponsors the Eddie Cantor and Mr. District Attorney program, among others. He is going to tell us just how and why the sponsors buy the programs you listen to. Introducing the vice president in charge of advertising of the Bristol Myers Company, a regular fella, a swell guy, a grand talker, and an old timer in radio, Lee Bristol. Lee, you know, after that build-up, the least you could do is to buy our program. Well, we'll skip that. Uh, seriously, what does a sponsor look for in buying a program, Lee? Graham, he buys a program for two purposes, and they go hand in hand. To put his sales message across to sell his product, and to please the public, not himself. Because if he doesn't please the public, he'll never sell his product. Exactly how do you go about buying a show? Well, the first thing we do is to see what programs are available. We know what programs are available for resale, that is, programs which have been sponsored and are of proven popularity but which can now be bought. We also consider new programs which are being offered for sale by the networks and by private radio producers and by our advertising agencies. Well, once you have a list of the programs you can buy, what else do you have to consider? Well, Graham, you have to consider the time available on the networks because that would influence the type of show you'd have. The hour at which people tune in influences the type of entertainment they're willing to hear. Daytime serials, spot news, comedy shows, dance bands, or what have you. The time also influences the type of audience willing to listen. Well, let's say that any time is available to you. What do you consider next? Well, there are two types of programs that you might decide upon. One is the program with a close connection between the show and the product, by which I mean that the Encyclopedia Britannica, for example, might, but doesn't, sponsor a program such as Information, Please. On the other hand, Graham, you might have a program of entirely flexible construction, which can fit any product, and which you might use if you're advertising two dissimilar products on the same show. Is there any way to guarantee that the program you buy will be a popular one, Lee? No. Of course, if the star of your show or the program itself is an established one, then you have a pretty good idea that what you buy will meet with favor. You also have to consider popular trends, and you follow those trends as much as possible. By which I mean, Graham, that if quiz shows are the trend, you might buy a quiz program. You know, Lee, I heard a program last week that wasn't a quiz program. Oh, you mean last Wednesday night? <laughs> yes. Isn't that Fred Allen terrific? Yes, he is, but we're sponsoring Eddie Cantor now. You can tell he's a sponsor. <laughs> Does your organization only buy established talent, Lee? No, Graham. We might buy a program on some small station which is making a local sensation because we could get it for little money. And the question of price must always be considered. If a sponsor can buy a program for less money and he thinks the program will do a good job, he'll sometimes take a chance, even though the program has not been tried out on a big network. Well, all I can say, Lee, is that if you're looking for a darn good radio program for one of your products, I heard a terrific one last Sunday. Well, what was that called? Behind the Mic. Behind the Mic? Uh, you've heard it? Oh, no. Oh, is that the one with Wallington? No, that's the one with McNamee. <laughs> Listen in next Sunday on NBC's Blue Network from 5.30 to 6 Eastern Standard Time. You'll love it, Lee. But seriously, thank you, Lee Bristol, for that inside information. Behind the Mic salutes a program you loved. We in radio believe that radio has a tradition of which it can well be proud, a tradition of good programs that linger fondly in our memory. And so each week, we bring you a star or a part of a program you used to hear, a program you loved. This afternoon, Behind the Mic salutes the old Palm Olive Hour, starring Olive Palmer and Paul Oliver, which was heard from 1927 to 1931 at 9.30 to 10.30 on Wednesday evenings. And now for the next few minutes, it is 1930, and we're in the midst of the listener's favorite, the Palm Olive Hour. I've just heard the golden voice of Paul Oliver singing the dream, and now the lovely Olive Palmer lifts her clear, beautiful voice in the kiss by Artiti. <laughs>
Joe Palmer and Paul Oliver. They will be back again with you next Wednesday. Olive Palmer was, of course, merely the stage name for a lady who was then and has been ever since one of radio's favorite singers, Virginia Ray. It was that program which began her rise to radio popularity. And Virginia, you certainly did a swell job this afternoon, and thanks a lot. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we had an ulterior motive in bringing those announcers' fluffs to the air early in the program. We hope that they encourage Bill Huck in case he makes any boners on his new announcing job. Bill Huck is the young man whom you heard audition on our program last Sunday. As a result of his appearance here, station WGAC of Augusta, Georgia, telegraphed an offer for Bill to join their announcing staff. Of course, Bill's sorry to leave his associations here in Radio City, where he has had the valued training and experience of NBC's famous announcers when they weren't making fluffs to help him. Bill, before you leave for your new job in Augusta, have you got a word to say? Yes, Graham, I certainly have. I want sincerely to thank Behind the Mic for making it possible for me to get this opportunity. And I should also like to thank Pat Kelly, NBC's announcing chief, for giving me that audition last week. And a boy, Bill, and I want to wish you plenty of good luck. Ladies and gentlemen, the first Blue Network program, which WGAC is carrying to its listeners in Augusta, is Behind the Mic. We hope... Behind the mic will help station WGAC to continue on the road to success and prosperity. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes on a radio program because of the illness of an actor or for some equally important reason, another actor is called in at the very last moment to act a part on a program. On some occasions, the actor actually goes on the air without having rehearsed with the rest of the cast and even without having had much of a chance or any chance at all to read his part. This may sound incredible to you, so this afternoon, we're going to show you in an unusual fashion the resourcefulness of radio actors. We have in an envelope a short playlet written especially for this program. We've called upon three actors to act in it. They've never seen the script, but they're going to perform it for you entirely unrehearsed. I am now taking the scripts out of the envelope and distributing them. You, Mr. Hampton, are to play the part of a 17th century English artist, a good-natured scamp. You, Mr. Harrison, are to play his blustering Cockney landlord. And you, Mr. Shirley, are to be a very proud and disdainful English gentleman who wants our artist to paint a picture for him. You ready, boys? Are you ready? Right. Come on, answer up. Are you I ready? Go, well, almost. Go. That's better. Very well. Let's begin. The time is late 17th century. The place is London in a poverty-stricken, scantily furnished garret. A young artist, William Hogarth, destined to become one of England's greatest painters, is busily painting one of his realistic street scenes for which he later became so famous. Ah, uh, a patron, no doubt. Enter, sir, you are... Oh, it's you. Yes, it's me, Master Hogarth. Who do you think it was, His Majesty? His Majesty... Oh, uh, Master Matthews, do you mind standing over here in this light? And now, look here. No, 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 no. no. Quiet, 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 quiet. Turn your face to the side a little more. Hmm? Ja, just as I thought. You are absolutely right, Master Matthews. You do look very much like His I, Majesty. I do. Now, really. Oh, some more of your eye-sounding talk. I came here to collect my rent. Your rent, sir? <laughs> Do you mean to say I haven't paid you your rent? Oh, uh, how careless of me to forget. Uh, you've been careless for three months, and you know it. And as my wife was telling me... I mean, as I was telling my wife... <laughs> it's long enough, and you pay today or... Uh, how to go into the street? My dear Master Matthews, uh, uh, what's my account? Uh, uh, how much do I owe you? One pound, 14 shillings. Oh, oh, a mere trifle. And you were upset about that? <laughs> Why, when you know my rich Uncle Marmaduke's only heir, I am he. Ah, <laughs> uh, my poor, my poor uncle. Uh, he's at the point of death. He was at the point of death a month ago. He was? Uh, well, uh, uh, you'll be pleased to know that he has recuperated. Now, see here. Look here. <laughs> 
Do I get my rent or don't I? Master Matthews, I will have it for you next week. Her Grace, the Duchess of Norfolk, was saying to me only yesterday, Hogarth, she said, will you paint my portrait at a price, of course? And I bowed, and I said to her, You know her Grace. Know her? Why, Master Matthews, it will please you to know she admires my work immensely. She may even pay a visit to my poor lodgings here. <laughs> It'll make you famous. So wait for your rent a while. The Duchess of Norfolk here? Oh, I'll go and tell the missus. <laughs> fly, my good man, fly, and bring a message of glad tidings to your wife. <sighs> I'll have to get the rent somehow. I can't keep putting him off much longer. Back again? I thought I told you... Master uh, Hogarth. Your servant, sir. I'm sorry I mistook you for another. Fellow, are you Hogarth? At your service, your... Uh, your Highness. Nonsense. Mr. Abingdon's the name. <laughs> At your service. Uh, will, will you sit down, Mr. Abingdon? Oh, no, no. No, no not there. <laughs> the leg of that stool is broken. Mm. <laughs> Mr. Hogarth, uh, I have no time to waste. I have a commission for you, if you wish. If not, I shall take it elsewhere. A commission? In that case, your humble servant, sir. Uh, what is the commission? I have a rather large wall space over the stairway in my house, which I want to have covered with a painting. I want the painting to represent a, a biblical incident, uh, the pursuit of the Israelites across the Red Sea by the Egyptians. The pursuit of the Israelites across the Red Sea by the Egyptians. Hmm. Uh, what are the dimensions of the space to be covered? Well, it's about uh, 16 feet long by about 6 feet in height. Now, as to your price... Da, 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 da. That's a pretty good, big task, Mr. Babington. I should say 15 pounds would be a fair price. 15 pounds? Ridiculous. I'll pay you three pounds. Three pounds for all that work? <laughs> Why, an apprentice would receive more. And I, sir, am a master artist. Master artist living here? Pray, Hogarth, uh, what do you take me for a fool? My dear Mr. Abington, don't judge my state by the poverty of my lodgings. It is a mere sentiment that makes me stay here. Instead of in the fine house I could well afford, the landlady here was my nurse. And I was, I was telling the Duchess of Norfolk only yesterday. She's having me paint her portrait, you know. I said to her, Your Grace... Five I... pounds is my price. Five pounds? Why, even that is... Is she here, Mr. Uh, no, 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 no. My, my good man, wait outside. Uh... Wait outside, can't you see? I have a visitor. I'll ring when I need you. Then you'll ring from outside in the street. I talked it over with my wife. And she says, if you don't give me one pound fifteen shillings, you owe us, you go out in the street. A <laughs> uh, 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 former servant of mine. Yes, Mr. Having a, uh, quite mad, you know. Master Hogarth, I've uh, changed my mind. I'll pay you one pound fourteen shillings to paint that wall. One pound fourteen shillings? For all that work? Take it or leave it. If you don't want it, I'll find someone who does. One pound, fourteen shillings. Well, Mr. Abington, I'll do it. I have no choice. The one pound, fourteen shillings must be paid now. Ridic... Oh, very well, fellow. Here's your money. Ah. But the work must be done immediately. I'll expect you uh, uh, at my house tomorrow, the, the Duchess of Norfolk. Okay. One pound, fourteen, for all that work... Uh, busy, I see. Well, uh, at least you're industrious. Industrious indeed, Mr. Abington. I was just about to step down from the ladder. Your painting is finished. Finished? Impossible. You've been in my house scarcely three hours. Let me see. Why, what, what, what's this? You, you, you've nothing on the wall but a large red smear. Are you not familiar with the incident you wished painted? The crossing of the Red Sea by the Israelites? Certainly I am, you, 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 you lout. I... I insist that all I see is a red smear. But that is the Red Sea. Nonsense, nonsense. Where, where are the Israelites? The Israelites have already passed over. Where, where, where are the Egyptians? The Egyptians? The Egyptians, sir, are drowned. <laughs> Thank you, Burford Hampton. 
Alfred Shirley and Stanley Harrison. That was an amazing piece of acting when you consider that the first time you saw the script was when you stepped up to the microphone this afternoon. Thank you all. <laughs> Be sure to listen next week when Behind the Mic will bring you the unusual story of how a song sung by Lanny Ross changed the lives of several of his listeners as told by Lanny himself. We will salute radio's first dialectician, Henry Burbig, and more of the human interest, the glamour, the comedy, and the drama that are found behind the mic. This is Graham McNamee speaking. Good afternoon, all. Behind the Mic is written by Mort Lewis. Original music composed and conducted by Ernie Watson. This is the National Broadcasting Company.